Hello, my friends and fellow Vedsies. Welcome to uh, another day of a vlog every day in September. Me and six other friends are doing a video every day this month, or at least trying to, and you can look in the description uh, to find links to all of their channels. Uh, welcome to another episode of Kistory as well. I try to do one of these each year when I do Veds, but I've been doing this series for a long time. This is like episode 25 or something. Anyway, I am on to 2009. At the end of my last video, I talked about that uh, Kiss in the summer of 2009 announced they were releasing a brand new album called Sonic Boom and announced that they were going to be doing a fall tour of the United States um, and that they would give the fans the opportunity to select what cities they were going to play in through a voting system, and then it turned out not really to be true. It was a whole thing. Uh, but in any case, the tour was set to start with uh, two shows at the legendary Cobo Hall. These were a big deal for KISS fans. Uh, September 25th and 26th, 2009, uh, KISS did two shows at uh, Cobo Arena, uh, which is the arena, of course, that was really the first time KISS ever had headlined an arena all the way back in May 16th of 1975. That concert was recorded for Kiss Alive. If you look at the back of the Kiss Alive album, you can see uh, the interior of Cobo Hall for that show. Kiss then did three shows there in 1976, three more in 1977, and it became a hub for them for years, and it was set to be demolished in 2009. So they got the honor of being the very last band to ever play Cobo Arena. Um, just amazing. I think the structure is still there in Detroit, but it's been gutted and turned into a convention hall, I believe. But in any case, a really awesome way to start the U.S. portion of the Alive 35 tour. Even though they had a new album they were promoting, Sonic Boom, uh, they still, for some reason, labeled this tour as part of the Alive 35 festivities. Um, so fitting to play a show at Cobo Hall and what's supposed to be uh, an anniversary tour celebrating Kiss Alive. For this tour, there would be a new stage design. Uh, it would still uh, incorporate a lot of the framework from the old Alive 35 staging setup that they used pretty much since uh, the Farewell Tour. Uh, but now with a lot of these little mini screens taking place of a lot of the amplifier cabinets, and they took the big giant Light Up Kiss logo and they put it like right in front of the drum riser on the stage. Which actually I thought was a kind of a cool design so you could have more lighting rigs and a giant screen uh, along the back lining of the sort of stage and it was really cool it was nice to see them change that up as well again KISS fans had been concerned that KISS was sort of stagnating to some degree that they were just rolling out the same costumes and stage year after year um, just doing the nostalgia circuit so amazing to get into KISS right at a time when they sort of got this burst of creativity uh, and we're doing new things again. On October 6, 2009, at long last, Sonic Boom was released, KISS's newest CD. Uh, I was 13 years old at the time. They were doing it as a Walmart um, tie-in, and I didn't have a Walmart in my town at the time. There were less of them in Canada back then than there are now, and... Obviously, I'm 13. I'm not driving myself around, so I begged my mom to go to the store and uh, buy the album for me uh, while well, I was going to come with her and find it. Um, she wasn't able to on the day of, I remember, and I remember spending the whole 24 hours like, there's other KISS fans listening to the album, and I didn't want to spoil myself, so I didn't. On day two of the album's release, October 7th, I got to go to the store and experience buying a new KISS album not quite day of release, but basically day of release. Um, they released it in this awesome package where the first CD was the brand new album, 11 brand new songs by Kiss. Again, their first album in 11 years, their first album, of course, since I had become a fan. Um, and then the second disc was Kiss Classics. It was, I think, 15 of their classic tunes re-recorded by them uh, once again. Uh, their new lineup with Tommy and Eric. And the third uh, was a DVD with, I think, six songs from uh, the Buenos Aires... The Buenos Aires... Uh, I can't really say that today. I don't know why. Buenos Aires. Uh, concert from their April tour of South America. It was a great 
package, and I loved the album when it came out. I just re-listened to Sonic Boom recently. I think it still stands the test of time. Maybe it's just because we all love the media that was released when we were like 12 or 13 and really getting into something, but that album really does still hold a magical spot for me in my KISS fandom, and I think they did a great job with it. Um, I think KISS fans mostly agree that it's a pretty good album. Some people have a problem with pretty much anything that uh, the Tommy and Eric lineup put out, but uh, Modern Day Delilah was the main single from that album, and I love that song. Uh, eventually, I think Say Yeah would be a single, and I want to say Never Enough was a single as well. Um, but yeah, some great songs from Paul, some great songs from Gene, and then Eric and Tommy get got to have their song as well. I just love Sonic Boom, one of my favorites in the KISS catalog. But uh, yeah, they motored along and uh, did that big tour uh, of the United States and Canada in the fall of 2009. Now, not only were we getting a new KISS album here, but uh, we were also getting brand new costumes. Now, KISS had, had many different costume styles over the years, but since the reunion tour, they'd basically just been throwing back to various eras. In the 70s, for the reunion tour, you had a Love Gun era throwback, and for Psycho Circus Farewell, they went to the Destroyer era, and then they went to the Alive era for a while, and then back to the Destroyer era of costuming. But really, since like Creatures of the Night, we hadn't had brand new like KISS costumes. And I remember hearing that they were going to have new costumes, and I remember just pacing around. I'm not a, a, a designer, or I'm not good at drawing or anything, but I even remember like taking pieces of paper and drawing what I think maybe the costumes would look like. And then I remember when the costumes came out, my initial instinct was that, oh, they're actually pretty similar to the Destroyer era of costumes, but still, we had a new defined era for the band visually. Um... And that was really cool to have again the first time in so long that uh, KISS were obviously focused on a new project whether, rather than throwing back to something old. I finally uh, got the opportunity to see my favorite band. It was November 14th, 2009, I still remember. It was at uh, General Motors Place, which is now called Rogers Arena in Vancouver. I vlogged a lot of concerts from there, but no, I was not vlogging at 13. Um... I swear to God, this sounds crazy, but it was like a religious experience for me. Uh, famed, I want to say 90s rock band, Buck Cherry was opening uh, for them, but uh, their whole set, I was just sitting in the in the audience like, I need them to get off the stage right now because Kiss is coming and I'm going to lose my mind. Um, I was in the lower bowl, uh, near the bottom of the lower bowl, but like not on the floor. And uh, yeah, the whole day I was just like vibrating, I couldn't believe it. Uh, it was like the greatest moment of my life to hear All Right Vancouver, You Wanted the Best, You Got the Best, the hottest band in the world, Kiss, and to sit there and watch their show for like two hours. It was everything I could have dreamed of and more. Just an amazing night. I ran into Doc McGee uh, at some point <laughs> for some reason. He was just wandering around. And we were like, my dad said something like, hey, you're the manager for Kiss. And he was like, yeah, people recognize me everywhere I go. It's like I'm more popular than the band. And I even at the time remember being like, okay, all right, okay. Anyway, um, so that tour lasts till December. If I recall correctly, uh, they weren't quite able to end it on their own terms because the last concert was canceled due to some sort of weather event. But uh, they took a couple of months off after that, uh, only really emerging to play a really weird club show in England in March of 2010 that had to be cut off early uh, because... Everybody was going to get asphyxiated by the amount of, uh, like, people were getting lightheaded from the amount of pyro and, like, dry ice smoke and crazy stuff in there. You can't make that up. It's crazy. But that was all to promote a new tour that was going to take place in May and June of 2010. The Sonic Boom Over Europe tour began in Sheffield on May 1st, 2010, and was the largest European tour they'd ever done up to that point. If you've heard me say that before, that's because they previously had had their biggest uh, European tour ever in 2008, and then did one even bigger here, the Sonic Boom Over Europe tour, uh, over two months in, uh, the spring slash summer of 2010. For this tour, they made further refinements to the stage setup, most notably a really awesome intro. They'd come out to modern day Delilah and stand on this platform that would go up over the drum riser and land them on the stage. Uh, I thought that was pretty cool. 
after the Sonic Boom Over Europe tour, uh, with very little time off in between, uh, Kiss went and did an outdoor tour of North America, playing mostly like Live Nation outdoor amphitheaters and such. Um, that tour was again given a totally new branding. They called it the Hottest Show on Earth tour, and that ran from July to October, using largely the same stage as the Sonic Boom Over Europe tour. Uh, it all ended uh, with a couple of shows in Mexico in September slash October of that year, but that was a grueling touring year for KISS. From the beginning of March through to October, they were steadily on the road, KISS of course getting older at this point, and after that they took a really well-deserved few months off. Now KISS's 2011 was kind of interesting, uh, it featured some sparse little one-off gigs and then also the start of the creation of a new project. Uh, KISS's first uh, order of business in 2011 was to do a three-date mini-tour in March, where they did shows in Puerto Rico. Well, first of all, they did a show in Puerto Rico uh, where they actually did not bring out the whole stage setup, the new one that they designed. They are back here to using the old Farewell slash Alive 35 stage setup, uh, but with the new costumes, of course. They then did a one-off show at the Houston Rodeo um, with a totally special in-the-round stage design there. That literally might be the largest audience they've ever played for in the United States. There was like something like 80,000 people there. It was really a big event for them. And then they did, I think, Hollywood, Florida, uh, back using the old stage design once again. Uh, in April, the band revealed that they were back in the studio yet again to make a follow-up to Sonic Boom. Again, as a kid, so freaking excited. Um, they weren't just one and done. They were still going to continue to create new music. Um, their studio sessions for this new record were interrupted a couple of times by other little tours. Uh, one starting with... They did this one off in Sacramento in May for some fundraiser which is only notable because they again brought out a scaled back version of the old uh, stage design. But yeah, that uh, old stage design definitely had the longest lifespan of any stage design KISS has ever worked off of, uh, being that it was designed in the year 2000 for the farewell tour and used on virtually every tour later, so that was the last farewell for that little stage. Uh, they built a sort of hybrid of the old stage concept and the new stage concept when they went back out on the road starting in June, playing a series of smaller markets across the United States and Canada. Now there are a lot of people that speculate, KISS fans have been speculating for a long time that that tour only existed because of fan backlash after the whole voting system for what town will your will KISS play in, you get to decide which town, was kind of exposed as being just for marketing. It was just a standard tour. They really didn't take the results of that into account at all. And then suddenly two years later they book these gigs that were largely in smaller venues in smaller markets across North America. And I think a lot of those lined up with some cities that people had voted for. So they thought that maybe two years later they were trying to make things right. Or at least using that data to influence what places would draw fans. But in any case, I wasn't worried about the motives because on June 27, 2011, I got a chance to see KISS a second time at the Abbotsford Center in Abbotsford, British Columbia. Uh, again, an amazing experience for that show. I was up near the front. I was in like row 11 or 12. Anyway, an amazing night to see them. Even though for them it was sort of a scaled back show. No Gene flying into the rafters. No Paul flying into the back of the arena. But it was still all Kiss and I had a great time. Uh, that tour ends on July 28th, 2011. And Kiss basically go back into the studio to keep working on this new project. this The sessions for this project seem to be way more drawn out than the Sonic Boom sessions, because they, they keep getting interrupted by little things, including Kiss's first venture into the world of cruises? Yes. In October of 2011, Kiss hosted the very first Kiss Cruise, which would become a really fun annual event. Basically, on the first day of the cruise, Kiss would play an acoustic show out on the cruise deck. And then for night two and three, they would do these indoor shows in the small uh, sort of theater space on the boat. 
they would do two shows just because they'd split everybody who comes onto the boat into either show A or show B. This was perfect for the diehard Kiss fans who'd be willing to spend like a couple thousand dollars to go on this boat and be with the band for four days and see that acoustic show and see an electric show where Kiss are going to play songs that we never would have seen them play at a regular concert. We're nuts for that kind of stuff. We love it. And... As a fan who didn't have the kind of money to go on this cruise, still getting the YouTube clips of them playing these songs for the first time in decades was absolutely amazing. They incorporated other little events into the cruise as well, little meet and greets with various members of the band, and they would also have other popular rock bands uh, join them on the cruise. Not sure who the other guests were on that first one, but I kind of cringed when I first heard they were doing a cruise because... You know, it was one of those late stage of career things people do. You know, the Music Legends cruises. And I was like, oh god, are we in Kiss Cruise territory? But they really turned that into an awesome event that I wish I would have got a chance to do while they were still doing them. A little too expensive for me. Anyway, after that cruise, it would seem that Kiss went back into the studio to finish recording the brand new album, as of yet untitled. Uh, the sessions ended in January of 2012, and that's where I'm going to leave this video. In the next video, we're going to talk about uh, the next album. Spoiler alert, it was called Monster, and the touring cycle for that album. I've done, like I said, something between 20 or 25 episodes of this stupid little series. Uh, I've slowed down on making these uh, episodes a little bit lately because I've only got a couple left. By my count, the way I want to structure this series, there are three episodes remaining. We've covered just under 40 years of Kiss's epic 50-year career, and uh, I will catch you again with a new episode of that, hopefully sometime soon, uh, and I'll catch you with a new video on this channel tomorrow. Thank you all so much for watching. I'm going to see you real soon.